Queen's Gambit is the 2020 Netflix show that broke all the records for a limited series based on the 1983 novel of the same name by Walter Tavis. It covers the life and career of our heroine, Beth Harmon, chess genius, as she discovers chess, faces different opponents, and she overcomes the shadow of her past personified as addiction to pills and alcohol. It's beautifully crafted and precisely handles the anachronism of a successful woman in a man's world in the 1960s. The story is comprehensive, chic, layered, and handles ideas like fluid sexuality with ease. The only criticism I can construct is the use of the magical token black friend trope, which limits a fabulous black actress, Moses Ingram, to a magical fairy godmother who comes to help Beth get her life back in order and allows her to go to the ball, I mean, Russian chess match. Considering the source material and extended character development in the original text, this criticism of the adaptation is important for creators to understand. Let's move on to The Queen's Gambit. Grandmaster Gary Kasparov observed that chess is life in miniature, but what is the life of a woman in the 1960s? And what is the life of a woman in a male-dominated profession and calling? Any calling is the heroine's journey. The Queen's Gambit is a powerful journey into the psyche of a woman coming into her own power. The show has layered symbolism of boards throughout the entire setting. She is also surrounded by flowers representing the power that she is coming into as she makes her way through this chessboard in macro through her life. The board is the miniature representation of the power as she is learning the rules of the game and the rules of life. Whenever she is moving throughout the story, we see reflections of the board in the floor of the school, of the different locations that she goes to, or as part of her own garment, she is wearing the chessboard as almost her colors to show that she is on her own journey on in her life's calling. But what is the game that she is playing in the macro? It's a woman's search for wholeness. Maureen Murdoch, in response to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, created a structure and a template that more closely fit a woman's experience called The Heroine's Journey, A Woman's Quest for Wholeness. She felt it was important to re-examine the concept of a hero's journey to help explain a woman's experience of going through the heroic steps because it helped during her sessions to map it to something because in the end, when we tell stories about our own life, they do fall into a storytelling structure. When we use this template as a frame to map Beth Harmon's journey, we find that she is seeking her own internal power the whole time. Both Campbell and Murdoch know that this power in the protagonist is the inner goddess. Their models just frame the perspective of how the hero or heroine realizes who they truly are and assumes that power. Beth walks into a version of her own life surrounded by squares and flowers as she learns the rules of this miniature and macro world that the power was within this whole time. When we apply the heroine's journey map to Beth's story, we learn how much the journey is a reflection of her own quest for wholeness. The first step in the journey is the separation from the feminine. And we can see this happen in Beth's death of her mother and the burning of the dress with the flowers 
around her own name that her mother hand embroidered. Her mother was very much associated with this feminine power of um, flowers. And throughout the story, we see Beth slowly reclaim the flowers as her own, leading into her actually planting and growing and putting down physical flowers in her own house. The next is the identification with the masculine and the gathering of allies. This is during the first episode when she leaves the choir practice and classrooms to knock out chalk out of the blackboard erasers and joins the basement and joins Mr. Scheibel in his games of chess and starts to associate herself with this very masculine game, at least traditionally in society. She is also outfitted with a page boy cut and is surrounded by displays of squared boards, not only in the forms of what is on the floor, but also the uniforms that they wear, the checkered patterns on the blankets. Each step she takes in the school is a step on the board in macro, reflecting her own life. She is established as a pawn in this game. Physically, she looks like one, but what's amazing about this symbol is that all pawns have the potential to become queens. She starts to learn the rules of the boys club and in the episode successfully defeats a mostly boys chess club at the high school, showing that she has successfully understood the roles of the game and can demonstrate her own power. In the second episode, we find that she has left the journey's threshold. And typically with Campbell and Murdoch, this means that you leave the home that you once knew. She sees the gateway to the school the door and walks through it and then is plunged into her new life in suburbia and her adopted home. This gateway is the gateway to the things that she is most invested in in her own power, which is her oncoming powers of chess and her oncoming powers of sexuality and her own internal sexual desires. This plays out in discovering the book on Capablanca at the same time as we see the couple making out through the bookshelf. She goes on to successfully have the two married together again in understanding her own power when she defeats Towns in the first chess tournament that she participates in. She not only embarrasses him and basically takes him to town, but also, it's first blood. She, she becomes a woman at this moment, experiencing her first period. And also, it shows the connection that goddesses have innately in them between death and life. She goes on to finish off Beltic and earn her right to go down and experience what Campbell would consider the road of trials. And this is where she goes and fights ogres and monsters and, you know, gains allies. And her first set of allies that she gains are the twins, who not only are very impressed with her uh, along the road, but also come and continuously support her wherever she goes with emotional support and support her mother and her adopted mother in understanding the game. At the same time, her mother becomes a full mother figure in her life, showing her that representation in her own journey. Part of the struggles that she goes through is reaching a co-championship with Benny, which in her mind is considered to be a loss, and then losing her mother and losing to the Russian champion in Mexico. In this, she regains the allies that she has defeated 
she starts to see that Towns has moved on to, to covering chess instead of participating in it. Beltic returns with new plans to become an engineer, but is there to support and be there for her after she loses her mother. And this is quite common when we get to this part of a journey is that the people that maybe perhaps were enemies at first become allies. In Fork, when she is betting with Benny in speed chess and then beating Benny in the US championship, she still doesn't find herself worthy after beating Benny and decides to go with him to New York to train up to face the Russian champion. In that move, we show that she still doesn't feel that she is worthy. This is traditionally where in Campbell's hero's journey, it's considered to be the boon of success. But in Marines, there's a very important qualifier. Even though she is considered to be the queen and the champion of the United States, she still doesn't feel worthy. She, this is an illusionary boon. She has the title, but doesn't feel that she is worthy of it or is still seeking something that she can't explain. This heads her down into the eventual spiral that we hit in later episodes after she trains with Benny and heads to Paris. In that we hit the crisis point or the midway point through her journey, not the show, and she experiences spiritual aridity and death. This is her peak crisis. She is literally spiritually thirsty. She is dehydrated. She is in a desert spiritually and is drowning herself in water to try to find emotional connection. She works with Cleo to try and find what she is missing and is confused about all of the emotions that she is feeling and can't seem to find the answer. She downs, I think, three or four pitchers of water while she's facing Borkov in the world championship. And she's still not able to overcome it. And she wanders through the abyss. In adjournment, we see that she is stuck. She is emotionally stuck where she is in that she's unable to move past all of the shadow baggage that she is carrying with her from the women of the past that she has brought with her, her mother, her adopted mother, all of these shadows which are personified in the show by her drinking and her addiction to the tranquilizers. This is where we see the absolute lowest point of the show and for our heroine Beth. She is in a crisis and a continuous failure. As soon as she has the urgent yearning to reconnect with the feminine, Jolene shows up in the nick of time and allows her to be given the reclamation of the different pieces of herself, understanding her mother. She dreams about her mother for the last episode of the show. She understands that shadow and how it doesn't have power over her anymore, even though she knows the power that it has. She puts away the drugs, she puts away the alcohol, and she heals the wounded masculine in Mr. Scheibel and understanding that he always ha was proud of her, even though he never said it, and that he she did have him as a connection. All of the men that were previously beaten, all pulling together into a found family and shared community, including Benny and Towns and Beltic and the twins. And then beating all of the men in Moscow this pushes her beyond the duality of the stage that she has set herself on. And finally, she becomes the queen goddess that she was meant to be. And she can go anywhere she wants to. The goddess roadmap and template that the story is built on really plugs into the symbolism of the show. The women around 
Beth, show her the different aspects of the power that she is collecting as she goes on her journey. She's given the wisdom of old age from her birth mother, Alice, uh, from the school matron, from her adopted mother. This is the, the power of the crone. Her mother, Alice, even lives in the middle of the woods like a witch. What's really important about this power that she is given is that she learns very early on to accept the faults of her personality, warts and all, because that in and of itself, not caring about the opinions of others, gives you power over yourself. If you can look beyond the anxieties of young age and walk boldly into a school or a, a tournament full of men, you're able to quickly cut to the chase of having your own power on display. Her adopted mother is an interesting character because she guides her through the journey from crone to maiden. In fact, she starts out as a crone type figure, not really caring what the world thinks of her, seen in her pajamas, doing things her own way, playing her piano. And then she learns through loving Beth that she can become a mother and learn to accept the role of nurturer, which in turn shows Beth that you can overcome failure and also learn to nurture and build a family and a community around you. She also understands sexuality and is encouraged by Alma to explore it safely. Later on, we see that Alma starts to become more maiden-like as she continues on her journey and teaches her not only you know, the joy of living your life to the fullest and having nothing but doors and bright futures open, but it also is reflected in the exuberance of Cleo and Jolene who show her that life is worth living to the fullest and to explore all of the potential, that nothing is not horizons and that no matter what age you are you can learn the lessons of all of these three feminine archetypes in the end she is born anew with all of the powers of a true goddess she understands all of the different aspects of the feminine and also has the power of life and death within her but we understand that she is a goddess from the first moment that she walks on the stage, even though she is in the guise of a pawn. She is dressed as a pawn in the beginning with her page boy haircut, which, you know, pawns were often considered to be infantrymen. And as she slowly starts to win her battle, she becomes to, she starts to look more and more like a queen and she proves herself several times throughout the show, including facing off against her adopted father to retain the castle and where it's shot specifically to show her gaining power and to out strategize him who wants to just take everything away from her. She shows, no, I own this and this is on my rules. Again, she's able to enter her old school later on and move anywhere she wants to. She's dressed all in black, like the black queen on the chessboard, moving amongst the rooms and the locations and is only challenged briefly by the current queen of the castle, her old school matron. As she journeys to reunite, we see her powers come out in the men that she defeats. Each of them represents a king that she goes about and defeats because in chess, every time that you defeat an opponent, you are defeating their king. Each of them is stuck in their own lives. Towns underestimates her 
and is still playing chess and hasn't moved on from that. Beltic doesn't really like chess and needs to be defeated by her to understand, hey, maybe this wasn't for me the whole time. Benny is surrounded by sycophant men and doesn't see the value in community and also has a, a tiny short blade sort of mirroring the parallel to a king piece which can only move a short distance and only take pieces within a short distance. And all of the Russian champions are all kings in their own right. One by one, as she defeats them, they understand that something is missing from their lives and she redirects them because as she defeats them, they are transformed. In the hero's journey, when a hero on his own path comes across the goddess it means that his life is about to be transformed she represents the full embodiment of the understanding of life and death in the universe she is the beginning and the end of the natural world and when a hero is ready to understand that, they then are able to take further steps into their own journey. In the Queen's Gambit, each of these king-like chess players all encounter her and are redirected once she fully defeats them. They are given a new path because they finally come to understand their own truth. So why is what the Queen's Gambit has done so important? The archetypes and symbolism that are present in the show stick with us. They get into our subconscious. Carl Jung would call them primordial images because they call to a subconscious part of our brain. And sometimes media ignores this symbolism because they haven't thought through end to end how much more powerful a work can speak to if it's speaking past just the languages of the script and the set design and the costuming and the music. If it's also speaking to the inner us, it will stick with us longer. This is why the Queen's Gambit is so powerful, is because it speaks to us on all of these different layers. I know whenever I finish watching a deeply subconscious piece of media, like a movie or a television show that plugs into symbolism, I have wildly vivid dreams afterwards. This only adds to the message that is being given to the audience though. It's just another way of communicating to the viewer. I deeply respect creators who know what they are trying to say and use every tool that they can to say it, speaking to us on all the layers that they have available to them. What can I say? They're grandmasters. <laughs>